Hello everyone and welcome to our latest Honey and Stag event. Uh, Kelly Lacey and myself, Jackie Collins, are bringing you a fabulous book launch uh, in, in our programme today. We are here to celebrate the launch of Sandra Ireland's uh, latest novel, Sight and Seen, out today on the 13th of August. And we'll be getting deep down within those pages. Also to say that in our discussion time, uh, we'll be joined later by book blogger Joanne Bairden and also bookstagrammer Emma Parkinson. So sit back, relax and get ready to find out what the amazing Sandra Island has been cooking up for us. So Sandra, are you there? Oh. Hello. Well, hello, Sandra. Welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm fine. I like the idea of cooking up something. It reminds mm. me of cauldrons and did you like things. did you like what I did there? Yeah, a little bit of yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um I was reading about you before uh before we met today, and I've read that you are known of, and I love this. The Queen of Scottish folklore inspired domestic noir. I think that's a beautiful <laughs> title. Do you like it? I love it. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's really good. <laughs> Isn't it just absolutely fabulous? Now, for anybody who is not familiar with your work, Sandra, to date, you you published the novels Beneath the Skin, Bone Deep, and The Unmasking of Ellie Rook. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's your body of work so far to be joined now by this latest glorious piece of work. And here it comes into picture. <laughs> da, da, da. How tempting. Silent scene published by Polygon uh, and, and out the 13th of August. We're, we're absolutely excited uh, that that can now be out in the world. Um, because I know that, I, you know, speaking to people, and I know there's been many people saying, I wonder when the next Sandra Island book <laughs> is going to be out. Um, and and, and we, we need to wait no longer. Now, before we get in into the novel, I, I just wanted to ask you very briefly, um, four novels in now, do you see yourself now as I am an author? <laughs> no. <laughs> Still that's not. That's the weird thing. It's the whole imposter syndrome thing, isn't it? But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it feels incredible. I, I mean, I'm aware of the work that goes into them because I'm sitting down and I have to write. But when they actually become, uh, you know, a a book like this, there's so much editing gone into it um, and then the cover picture has to be chosen there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes so it be you become slightly divorced from the actual book if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I feel yeah. my work is done when I'm actually there at the typeface and then mm -hmm. suddenly it becomes um, something a little bit apart so it's always a little bit of a surprise when you see it in print it's weird mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I love the way you talk about that thing though that it is it really is um, an, an ongoing creation that, yeah, that, that yeah. the formation of the narrative, the whole idea, those ideas that you put together and then hand it over to someone else and and then it becomes yeah. that, 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 I don't know, I don't want to call it yeah. a product because it sounds, sounds a little bit tacky, but it becomes that beautiful creation that we, yeah. you know, get, get to enjoy. And also, I'm now writing something else. So I'm still in Sarah Sutherland's world, but I'm a step ahead of you guys. So mm. that that is funny as well, because I'm seeing that development, which mm. obviously hasn't got to, to, to the shops yet. So mm. it's really, it's, a, it's an interesting process, very interesting, but slightly scary. <laughs> but, but slightly, slightly scary. So I think it's a perfect place for us to start to talk about your main protagonist. Um, because your three previous books were standalones. Yeah. And from what I'm hearing, this is marvellous news. So today's book is not the one and only. Um, I like the notion of a Sarah Sutherland thriller. Mm, lovely. And there will be more. Who is, could you, could you begin by telling us who is Sarah Sutherland? 
she's just an ordinary woman she's an ordinary wife we like the rest of us <laughs> and she's heroes come in all different shapes and sizes and she's struggling with a lot of things in her life but she's a very passionate very honest um person uh, she is feels an injustice very deeply and she has a lot of hidden passions a lot of things that she feels she might have missed out on um, she has a lot of responsibilities which um, place quite a burden on her. So she's no different to the rest of us. Uh, you know, we all have things that we have to cope with. And I wanted to make somebody that was very much part of the domestic setting. Mm -hmm. She's not a high flyer. She's just uh, doing what she does and getting through life one day at a time. Mm. And I, I enjoyed writing her. Um, and I think she's a really interesting character. And I had to laugh. Excuse me. The other day, somebody wrote about my other books. Uh, they wrote a lovely review of this, an early review of this, which was really nice. But they said that my other characters were kind of morally dubious, which I quite like. I didn't set out to write morally dubious characters, but she had, that there was a point there. And I think Sarah is uh, the kind of antithesis of that. She's very upright, very upright person. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Did you, when you, you know, you say that difference, did you consciously set out to make her in that way that there would be no ambiguity about this woman's morality or anything like that or decisions made that, that you know, that she would be that almost like bellwether, you know, of... Yeah, of yeah. No, I didn't really. I think I set out to write a family story. I, Mm -hmm. Obviously, <laughs> the way I write it wasn't going to end up like an ordinary cosy family saga, obviously. Um, but I wanted to write something about the the ties that bind, the, the, the things that keep us together. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've been through, I think that's more important than anything, because at the start of all this, of the pandemic, that was the one thing that you reached for all those people that were in your family, whatever shape that family might take mm. and obviously the book was already written then but I think it's really relevant to now and uh, so I wanted to write about family uh, what keeps us together what irritates us about our relations <laughs> that kind of thing and it just uh, Sarah became this sort of uh, linchpin of this family I guess Mm. I, I I love what you say. It's it's a bit warts and all, isn't it? Um, this this revealing of there's no such thing as as the perfect family. No. Um, sitting within then the the subgenre of domestic noir, I, do you you seem from what you're saying you feel at home within? Yes, I think so. Um, as I say, it was never going to be a cosy family saga, but the more I wrote, well, I started writing this book just after my dad had passed away. So mm -hmm. there was that element as well. And I know a lot of uh, authors who say that they've been totally unable to write after a bereavement. And I did wonder, is, is that going to happen to me? You just don't know how you're going to react. Mm -hmm. um, I cared for my dad for a very long time. Um, so there was a big gap in my life and actually writing this book really, really helped. And I love the idea of writing for well-being. And I, I think I, you know, I teach creative writing and I I always um, bring that approach into writing. I, it's quite cathartic. So, yeah, the book came from quite a strange place. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's richer for that because mm. at that time I was thinking about my family and you know, how in many ways it was shrinking. And I think a lot of people can identify with that. It's beautiful. Thank you for, for sharing that. I wonder if you'd give us a wee treat, the first of our readings. Would you take us to, to your first section? Yeah, well, the first bit I'll read for you is um, is actually about Ailey Gowdy, who's the witch. So um, just to set the scene for you, Sarah Sutherland has a nice little sideline. She actually works at a supermarket, but she has a nice little sideline of taking visitors around the town of Kilgower. So if you've ever been on a ghost walk around uh, Edinburgh or Stirling or any of these great places, uh, you'll know that it, it can attract quite a, a disparate bunch of people. So Sarah has her little band of witch hunters and she's taking them um, along the paths that Ailey Gowdy used to walk. There is another house to see. You'd mistake this one for a lockup or an old buyer, maybe. 
No one can decide what to do with it. It has sedum growing in the cracks in the harling and ferns sprouting from the gutters. What paint has left is the colour of dull yellow lichen. An old horse-drawn grass rake is positioned out front as a nod to its rural roots. Various plans have been mooted. The Kilgawa Development Trust want to raise funds to turn it into a heritage centre. The council prefers the cheaper option of demolition. Its fate is uncertain, but it too is hanging on. This house is a short walkway along Butter Wind and down the steps to the main road. Don't cross the road, but stay on the pavement and turn sharp right. Keep walking until you come to the park, the haunt of dog walkers, teenage lovers and underage drinkers. The grass is kept short, the borders neat and the dog bins empty. It's all very civilised, except, except if you keep walking, you come to a wood. The wood isn't quite so civilised. The house I want to tell you about is in the wood. I gather my little group of witch hunters together. This is reputed to be the home of Ailey Gowdy, the town's most notorious witch. Gasp. One of the girls checks her phone, probably cross-referencing me with Google, but I resist the urge to grab the bloody thing off her. Ailey was a young woman who lived here with her father and younger siblings. Her father was a suitor, a shoemaker, and Ailey looked after the younger children because her mother had died in childbirth, an occupational hazard for women in those days. So what did she do? The girl slips her phone into her jeans pocket, giving me a little surge of hope. Did she cast spells? The guy with the Hogwarts scarf shuffles closer. Of all the witches, and there are several associated with this town, Ailey is my favourite, not least because when she married, she and her husband used to live in my house. As always at this point, I can feel the interest shift to me, to my personal life. What sort of house do I live in? Is it haunted? Have I ever experienced anything spooky? The questions come thick and fast, but I definitely turn the focus back to Ailey. That's why we're here. I suppose I feel I've come to know her over the years, I say. Her husband, Robert, was a weaver, producing linen for the export market. And in my back garden, Ailey would have grown plants for dyeing the cloth, such as woad and madder. Upstairs, the floorboards were warped by the weight of the loom. They creak when I walk on them. And every day when they do, I think of Ailey and the wrong that was done to her. She was wronged. Every time I do this to her, I try and put the wrong right as best I can. It's not the whole truth, of course. I don't think of Ailey every time my floorboards squeak. That would just be weird. But you have to ramp it up for the punters and give them a bit of drama, a bit of pathos. That's the art of storytelling. Once I'm sure of their attention, I set the scene. One day, Ailey took one of her siblings to the town well. I'll show you where that is in a minute. I suppose he was a bit cross and making a fuss and Ailey had to ask one of the other women to hold him while she drew water from the well. That's when it started. I look around the circle of faces. They are already with Ailey as she tries to juggle the screaming infant and her wooden pail. The woman who helped her reported to her neighbour that the child's hair smelled of brimstone. Ha! The devil, says waterproof woman, as if she knows him personally. I nod. It only takes a little bit of gossip in a small town to spread a story like wildfire. And Ailey had form. A few days earlier, a butcher of this Paris, one Archibald Donald, had asked for Ailey's hand in marriage. She'd refused. Probably because she couldn't leave her father with all those kids, or maybe she already had an eye on her future husband, or maybe she just didn't fancy him. Anyway, Archibald went to see a local cunning woman. Isn't that the same as a witch? The teenager's mum thinks she's being shortchanged and that maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. There's a very fine line between the old ways and witchcraft. The authorities turned a blind eye to cunning folk and what was termed natural magic. Holy wells and plant remedies were fine. Calling up dark entities was not. That was maleficium, evil doing, and I'll tell you about that too. 
The woman told Archibald to bring her some combings from Ailey's hairbrush. Yuck, one of the girls made a face. What was she going to do with that? Concoct a charm that would make Archibald irresistible to Ailey. Archibald bribed one of the kids to bring him the combings, but Ailey found out and snipped off some of the hair from a cow's tail and substituted that instead. Apparently, at church that Sunday, a heifer made its way up the aisle and stood mooing beside Archibald's pew. It found him utterly irresistible. There's a ripple of amusement. Unfortunately, it made him a laughing stock, and he was not amused. He swore he'd get even with Ailey Gowdy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sandra. You give, us, yeah, you give us that beautiful insight to, you know, the core of putting a wrong right. Um, and, and I love that that is the driving force in a way behind behind Sarah Sutherland. Um, but you introduce us in that reading to the town of, of, of Kilgara and, and to, shall we say, the other protagonist, um, Ailey. Before we talk about her, though, the town that you create, because I'm right in thinking that it's fictional, is it yeah, not? Yeah, fictional, yeah. Yeah, okay, so when, when you began with this idea to write the novel, did you sit down and sort of like sketch out a plan of the town, of what it would look like? No, it's a kind of a fusion of different um, towns. I was slightly inspired by uh, Montrose, which I live on the East Coast. So this, um, we had a, we have a huge um, history of witch trials. So um, the nearest town to me is big town is is Forfa, where um, there was a huge witch trials there. I think about twenty two people were killed. And then further up the coast, there's Montrose, which um, still has a lot of these. Um, very creepy little alleyways. Uh, in Forfa, you've got uh, Butter Wines, you've got the Butter Market, and all these old place names still survive. So I was kind of slightly inspired by that to put them all together. So the whole place is kind of a figment of my imagination, mm. but using all these little places in the landscape. Mm, beautiful. And and then so Ailey, um, is... It, it, because I know that, that that folklore for you is very, very important. So did you discover this character in the research that you've been doing? Um, how did you come across her? Who is she? Well, again, a bit like the town, she's a fusion of different witches. I went on the um, Edinburgh University website. I can't remember. I can never remember the actual name of it, but uh, they have a fantastic um, resource which has all the um the, the trans uh, the all the witch trials the the witness accounts all transcribed that's the word i'm looking for i think uh, and put on this database um it's it's very very fascinating you can just dip in you can look for the witch trials in your area you can look for certain individuals you can even look your up your family name to see if you know, you were perhaps related to one of these people um so that was really interesting and there was a lot of really interesting little snippets in the witness um transcriptions which inspired me so i've taken like the story that you, that you heard of the the hair combings and the heifer and that is actually taken from uh, little bits of the the trials that I've read and I just think it, it's weird and quite humorous but also really scary when you think about what was behind it and um, you know I say in that that piece that um or certainly Sarah says that you know these little towns were a hotbed of gossip I see that in where I live at the moment even now and it's always, it must have always been that way. But unfortunately, um, some of these little bits of gossip um, got feet and legs. And in more troubled times, that could have been the undoing of you. Yeah. And, and how, how at that time, and even maybe in these times as well, do you undo the damage yeah. that has been done? And and yeah. what I find interesting, though, is that, is that, that your main character is wanting to do that from a historical difference mm -hmm. um, or distance. Um, 
uh, and you know whether or not she is is successful in that well people will have to read the book and find out how that goes because 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 that's important um before we go to to a to a, another section of reading um I wanted to ask you. Um, there's another character that that I'd like to, to to talk about, and and that's Sarah's nemesis, Grant Trant. Yeah, Grant Trant. What Trant Grant is her father? <laughs> <laughs> um, tell 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 the viewers um, who is this man, uh, 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 and you know. The problems that he brings. Why is he that nemesis? Well, I think he's um, again. He's grown up in a small town. He's younger than Sarah. Um, he, she, she is his boss at the, as we meet them at the start of the novel. Um, he's a bit of a rebel, but he's um, he doesn't really have anything to rebel against. He's been brought up in a small town. He's um, his mom's a single mom. He's had a really hard um, paper round, if you like. So he, he's got an attitude. He's got a chip on his shoulder. But actually, um, he's he's really good character underneath. Um, but <laughs> Sarah has to dig quite deep to find that. <laughs> and it turns out that uh, because she's basically sacked him, he ends up getting a job elsewhere, shall we say, <laughs> and they meet again. They meet again. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it because, like, you know, normally the notion of the nemesis and it sounds, you know, it's full of menace and and, and danger, but, but, but you work this in a very interesting <laughs> dynamic. I love it. So um, because I'm aware of time and, and I know we have other, other, other questions coming as well. So would you take us to the next section of your reading? Yeah, sure. Um, I actually printed all these things out so there wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be fiddling with the book. Uh, so this little bit uh, introduces you to Sarah's father, John. Uh, John is having a lot of issues with his health. Um, he's in his 90s. Sarah was a late baby and uh, she's an only child. So the duties of caring fall to her. And I, I, I really wanted to write about that in the book. So here we meet John when uh, he's uh, searching, as always, for something he's lost. John came across the pen while searching for his checkbook, a big fat fountain pen in a presentation box inscribed with his name, John R. Milton, and the date of his retirement. That little torch of Sarah's had been a godsend, illuminating all the dark corners where things can hide. Old age is no joke. When the eyes start to go, you might as well turn up your toes. Imagine 30 years at the Building Society and now he can't even find, see to find his checkbook. The fountain pen has distracted him. It's heavy and smooth, a superior quality pen. He rolls it in his fingers like a fine cigar. He always used a fountain pen at the Building Society in the old days for signing documents, taking notes. No computers then, just reams of heavy paper. Words carry more weight in heavy, on heavy paper. That flimsy stuff they use nowadays. From time to time, Sarah prints off Hannah's emails. Goodness knows where in the world Hannah is now, but she always signs off with love and hugs to Grandad and three kisses. He pretends he can read the emails, but the words swim off the edge of the page like fish. He has a bottle of quink somewhere, probably in the same drawer. He renews his efforts, piles more bric-a-brac onto the table. When Marjorie was alive, everything was shipshape. But he's letting things slip, and slipping makes him anxious. The ink hasn't been used for a good while and the cap is stuck fast. Despite his best efforts, it won't budge and he becomes short of breath and has to sit down. With persistence, the cap finally gives way and he chuckles in triumph. He sniffs the ink. His raw classroom whiff takes him back to his salad days. Scribbled notes in Latin class, wartime love letters. Without warning, the bottle slips from his grasp and drops to the table. Oh, bugger. He's always made a point of not swearing in front of his daughter, but luckily Sarah is at work. She's not going to like this. Helplessly, he leaves a towel soaking up the ink and goes in search of the time. He can't see his watch very well nowadays. 
The dining room and lounge are open plan, so it's just a few steps to his favourite easy chair. Amazing how your world shrinks as you age. He used to be able to see the wall clock perfectly from that chair. He could programme his day by it. Breakfast radio, sandwich, lunchtime news, maybe an old Ealing comedy in the afternoon. But now the clock face is a blur. He's been known to have his lunch at half eleven because he's mistaken the position of the hands. Nowadays, he has to go into the hall through to the bedroom to check the digital clock radio. The numbers there are large and illuminated, but even that isn't foolproof because sometimes he presses the wrong button when he tries to change channels. Once he spent an entire weekend three hours ahead of the rest of the UK. He can't resist a little chuckle remembering. Not so much GMT as Milton, meantime. Now the digital format reads 1,500 hours. That feels about right. Sarah won't be finished work for another hour or so. He remembers the ink and slumps down on the edge of the bed, exhausted. That's when he sees them. His stomach does a little flip. A voice trembling with false bravado, he calls out, I can see you, you know. Don't think you can hide from me. No answer, of course. They never reply. He's become accustomed to their silence. Although every sighting of them puts a fear of God into him, he can never tell when they will appear. It's random, like a snowstorm or an earthquake. They're tall and thin and pale, like those elongated marble statues you see in churches that never look in proportion. He screws up his eyes and tries to see their faces, but they shift like smoke. He calls out again, away you go, my daughter will be here soon and she won't be happy. He can't make out how many there are today. Sometimes they sit on the couch while he's watching TV and he forgets he's afraid of them, pretends he's talking to Sarah or old Mrs Chalmers from next door. He chats away, remonstrates with them without ever expecting a reply. It's company. He gets fed up of it being one-sided, though. It's not as if he's even invited them in. During the ad breaks, he always asks them to leave, and sometimes they do. But then he gets anxious about where they've gone and what they've been doing. He has to get up and follow them. He loses the thread of his favourite TV programme, and it's exhausting. But he can't bear the thought of them going through his stuff. He shouts at them again, cross now. Get out of my house this minute or I'll call the boys in blue. They don't like that. He blinks his eyes rapidly and they're gone. Just like that. That's me. Sandra, <laughs> so so beautiful. I, I wanted to say that in, in that passage that you've just read, and, and you mentioned it when we started our conversation, there's there's a real labour of love in there, in in the way that you are recounting, um <laughs> this this man's experience. It's really tender, and 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 I wanted to come back because you mentioned about writing, you know, for well being, and you mentioned that you do a creative writing class, um, and, yeah. and I just wondered in 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 hosting those classes and being the person who delivers those classes. Have you learned things whilst you've been doing the delivery? Definitely. Well, I started off doing writing for wellbeing classes. I, I worked for a couple of charities. Um, this is several years ago now. Uh, worked in healthcare settings. And it's really obvious. So what, what I learned from that is that everybody has a story to tell. And it doesn't really matter how you tell it or who tells it, if that makes sense. Because sometimes... If you don't get a chance to tell your own story, it lives on in other people. And I think that's what I found when I was writing this, that even though I didn't set out, I wasn't writing about my dad, I was writing a character, but a lot of my dad's phrases and the things that he used to say came out. And it was really funny that um, my sons have read the book, they they read it quite early on. And my eldest son said, oh, that's granddad. Granddad Mm -hmm. used to say that. So it's Mm -hmm. lovely in a way for us as a family that um, some of the things, even though this isn't, the character Mm -hmm. is not my dad, some of those things have lived on. And I think that's quite a nice legacy. Mm -hmm. Definitely, without a doubt. Um, 
Well, um, I am going to love you and leave you for a little bit now. Uh, and we're going to welcome onto the screen uh, Joanne Baird. Joanne, I'm really sorry I called you Baird at the beginning. I blame Sharon <laughs> Baird for that. Um, so Joanne Baird, book blogger uh, uh, of the Portobello book blog, massive author supporter and book reviewer. Uh, she's going to come in now and she's got some more questions for you on Sight and Scene. And I'll be back later. Bye for now. Thank you, Jackie, and I'll forgive you about the name. No problem. <laughs> Hello, Sandra. Thanks, um, I, I just say, um, obviously, I've had an early copy of the book, which I finished last night, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Really thoroughly oh, enjoyed it. Okay. Now, one thing I really love is the way that you weave folklore into your story. You've been talking about uh, witches, obviously, earlier on today. And it, to me, it's kind of like there's a story within a story within a story, the way that you write your books, a bit like Russian dolls. They're all kind yeah. of you know like one one within the other yeah. which is which is really really clever um, and i just wondered if there's any other folk tales that you're you know that's like kind of one of your favorites that you would really love to be able to put into a book in the future oh that's a good question um i love um animal folklore um there's a, a, a brilliant tale of the black fox. The black fox is supposed to be slightly demonic in origin. So a bit like the old sort of black dog stories that you sometimes hear about. If you see a black fox, it's supposed to um, be a harbinger of something. I wouldn't like to say doom, but um, it's a messenger of some sort. And I did many, many years ago, write a novella that uh, featured a shape-shifting fox. I don't know if that's... Um, you know, available for public view, but um, I would definitely like to take that story. I think it's quite fascinating that we take, even nowadays, um, something like the black fox story, you can see that in newspapers, you know, people might have seen a black fox or a white stag or something that's a little bit different. And it is, you know, it's newsworthy. And I, I find that quite interesting because we're still looking for a mystery. We're still looking for folklore. So I think interesting yeah and um you know given all your your obvious interest in myths and legends and superstitions do you have any little superstitions or rituals that you follow when you're writing oh <laughs> that's a good one isn't it um I, I i'm a bit of a beach comer so i like to um walk i like to go for a walk before i start writing so i inevitably pick things up on the beach so I like um uh, stones shells definitely stones I'm very attracted to stones and sometimes down on the beach there I find the little hag stones you know the ones with the the holes through and that actually one of them found its way into the into the book so I sometimes sit with those just sitting beside me on the on the desk I don't know if they do me any good <laughs> maybe they feed my imagination uh, you certainly get some lovely photographs when you're out on your walks. I've seen them on Instagram and places like that. Um, so the, the Sarah Sutherland book um, is the first of a series. I know Jackie said earlier your, your previous books have been standalone, and I, I'm certainly very pleased it's the first of the series. I think she's a, a great character, and um, I'm obviously not going to give anything away, but it, it certainly ends with some shocks and a, a bit of a... a yeah. A cliffhanger, I would say. I, I just wondered how different is it when you started writing it? Did you know this was going to be a series, or you know, how, how different is it writing yeah. for a series than a standalone? Well, I think I wasn't really clear that it was going to be a series, but when I started writing about Sarah, I liked the character and I wanted to develop the character more so I was really conscious that she was going on a journey which probably couldn't um you know it would probably last longer than the one book uh, and as it happens Sarah um is um is a carer she's looking after her dad but also she's concerned with her young daughter well she's in her 20s she's traveling abroad and <laughs> somebody of a son who is traveling abroad it is it's always in your mind. So I, I thought, well, you know, I could go down different routes with this, shall we say. So it's all about family and responsibility and looking out for people, but um, it's intergenerational. So I thought that was quite an, an interesting approach. So 
the second book, uh, no spoilers, but the second book involves Hannah, the daughter. Well, that's good because she's the cliffhanger, isn't she, really? Yeah, a <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> Just a bit, yes. Um, you, you mentioned that your uh, your family have read your your book already and I, I just wonder what do your family think about your books and your writing I'm, I'm sure they're very supportive but in the same way when you pass it out to readers for the first time it must be a bit nerve-wracking asking your family to read your books it is really nerve-wracking I never ask them to read it they ask me can they read the book and I'm like well okay <laughs> um, my um, eldest son is is Jamie he's the one that's most interested in books he's a, an avid reader so he usually reads it quite quickly straight away probably before it's actually edited so he likes to get his hands on an early copy and he it, it's interesting because they pick out things that um nobody else would notice just little details that he might say to me oh, I remember when we've been there or we've done that and it's a very, very much a family thing or maybe a personal thing to me which they pick up which other people probably wouldn't notice um my other son Callum he's out in Vietnam he uh, so <laughs> that's quite tricky getting him a copy but he does he does read them which is quite good because he he's not a reader he'll read articles online but he's not a great fan of books so it's really quite flattering to have them read the books uh, as for uh, the rest of my family yeah, my brother and my sister and my nieces nephews are all very very supportive so I'm not quite sure how they think of me after reading the books but <laughs> might change and, their opinion. <laughs> and so you, you, this book's going out on a, a blog tour, which for people who don't know means that lots of uh, bloggers and early reviewers and people on Instagram will be reading it and uh, sharing the reviews on certain. So what's that like when you hear from your readers? Oh, it's really scary. It's really scary. I mean, obviously it's nice if people like the book, but you're always afraid because you're so close to the book. It's really hard to be objective. And, you know, some people have said the book's quite funny, quite warm and funny. And I'm, I'm really pleased with that because I didn't set out for it to be funny, but just some of the situations that it gets in are mm -hmm. quite easy, you know. Uh, so I'm kind of glad. Um, yeah, I'm kind of glad to find it funny and a little bit more lighthearted than some of my books. So that's that's nice. And it's nice for me to write. Uh, not that it, I mean it is creepy, but uh, there are some sort of more light-hearted moments, so that's nice. But yeah, the reviews are quite scary. But everybody's very generous, especially the book bloggers. They've all been really, really, really supportive to me, and I'm very appreciative of that. There's certainly quite a few funny moments with Grant, especially yeah. when he worked in the supermarket <laughs> at the beginning. That was quite yeah. amusing. <laughs> okay, just one last question from me then. Um, have you ever wanted or, or felt like you might want to revisit one of your characters? Obviously, you're going to write about Sarah again, but are there any other characters from your previous books, even though they're standalones, that you think, you know, what happened next for them? Maybe you know in your head what happened next, but have you ever been tempted to write about them again? Or are there any that your readers have said, I need to know more? Um, that's interesting. I think Beneath the Skin, my debut novel, um... Uh, the, there's a taxidermist in there, Alice, who's a very quirky, interesting character. And lots of people want to know more about her because she could go down several several routes. She could uh, turn out to be um, uh, quite a dangerous woman or she could see the light. Who knows? So that would be quite an interesting one to write. Very intriguing, so. yes. <laughs> Well, I'm going to pass over now to Emma, who is a bookstagrammer, and you'll find Emma at Book Love Life, and I think she has some more questions for you, but thank you so much for answering mine, Sandra. Thanks, Joanne. Hi, Emma. Hello. Hi. <laughs> this is strange um, to be so meeting like this. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, one of the questions that I've always wanted to ask like most authors to be honest um do you have like a system that you go through when you're writing so do you do you write the ending first and you know where it's gonna go or do you just start writing and see what happens or <laughs> my writing is just a glorious model I know exactly <laughs> where I'm going I know what I have to do to get there 
but the the book I'm writing at the moment, you've got me on a bad day because I have no idea where it's going. So yeah, I know where I've got to get to, but there is a point where you have to gather the even together the loose ends and see if they are going if you're going to be able to tie them up because if I like to work with a lot of different strands in the story, so there's a lot of subplots and things going on. But I suppose every writer can identify with this. It's really the, the, the most difficult part is gathering all those strands together and making it work. Mm. Don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> it does, it does. Um, was Sarah based on anybody that you know? Uh, no, but a lot of people have said that she's the character that mo is most like me. <laughs> but <laughs> having having said that she's a morally upright person, I feel quite proud. <laughs> but I, I don't actually see her like me, but I guess other people sort of see different things, mm. you know, and it's all, it's all open to interpretation, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like if I've ever started to write something, I feel like I'm writing about me and then I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're bound to, it's, um, you know, it's Sod's law that you're going to put in bits of yourself or um, your own judgments and things. And it's unavoidable because you're writing from the heart. So things will creep in, I guess. Yeah. Um, you did touch on it a little bit with regards to John and your own father. Um, yeah. How did it actually feel writing about that? Obviously, with it being so personal to yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, was it sort of therapeutic? I know you did mention that you felt it was sort of writing for well-being. So did the whole process feel therapeutic to you? Yeah, I really enjoyed writing that. Now I'm kind of thinking, oh, my goodness, my family's going to read this and think, why are you writing about our dad? <laughs> But, but actually, uh, the the process of writing was very, it was lovely because um, I I kept remembering things that he'd said and um, he had some funny little quirks and things he used to say and just things he used to do. So it was really nice to write all that down and record all that. And I, I hope people will like the character of John as a character because no. Nobody knows my dad that's going to be reading the book, probably, or not many people. Um, but I hope, um, you know, the, the nice little things he used to do. And also, he could be a, a little bit of a monkey, you know. He was he liked, he liked the yeah. attention. And um, I think the character of John is slightly like that. So, you know, he can lay the the guilt trip on Sarah so that she yeah. has to drop what she's doing and go. And, and that, that was part of my life for a while. <laughs> so it's probably quite nice to write about that, too. The dance yeah. Side of sharing. <laughs> yeah I've got to say I did love the character of John I thought it was oh, absolutely amazing. fantastic and it wasn't until I finished the book that I found out obviously that it was partly based on your own dad as well yeah. um, so that that made him like even more likable then because he was oh, based on a real person <laughs> yeah that's lovely thank you for saying that you're welcome you're welcome um how did you come up with such a mix of different topics, genres within one book. Because, like, even on on the back of the book, it says um, it's a tale of family ties, mystery, and suspense, love and sacrifice. Uh, you've got historic witch trials and modern day slavery. That is a lot to fit in one book, <laughs> but at the same time, yeah. it was so it wasn't complicated to read or anything. It was it all just flowed so perfectly. <laughs> it's been very well edited by my <laughs> editor who totally gets where I'm coming from and um, I probably do try and pack too much uh, into it but I always as I'm writing the, the themes sort of present themselves to me so even if you're just writing about folklore there's certain themes that you say oh you know I can identify how we think nowadays so that ties in with our modern mindset so that's always intriguing to me. And then uh, when I was writing about the witch trials, there was lots of things came out about how these women don't have a voice, how, um, you know, small things that might pass people by are actually blown out of all proportion. So there was the whole sort of small town gossip thing going on. And then that made me think about how, what what's happening in a, a small town 
behind closed doors that we're not necessarily picking up on. Mm. So there was a lot of things that came out that could all be, even things about the church that's quite timely now. Um, they all sort of presented themselves to me as I was writing. So then I had the challenge of trying to tie them in in a, a kind of an entertaining way, I suppose. I didn't want it to be laying down the law about my thoughts on things because that's not the, the nature of fiction. So I've kind of put them all out there and hopefully people will enjoy reading about these themes and making their own uh, assumptions from that. Mm. Yeah, I've got to say, it was one of those books where I think I read the first chapter and I was hooked. It was oh, good. It <laughs> straight away. I loved it. <laughs> thank you. That's so nice to hear. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Well, thank you for asking, uh, answering sorry, my questions. So I will pass back to Jackie now. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank, thank you. you. Hi again, Sandra. Hello. Um, hi, lovely. I, I'm so enjoying the, the the this conversation about a book that that I agree with what, what with what Joanne and what Emma have just said. Um, it's just so engaging and and it transports you transports you away. It's a book that's needed for now. Thank you. Yeah, it's so lovely. I I wanted to ask you about the title, if I might. Um, well. <laughs> sight unseen because being the linguist that I am when you get something sight unseen that means something to me but I wondered choosing the title that you did what did it mean to you why did you go with that well I'd be interested to hear your interpretation but but for me I was looking and this has been a bit of a challenge for me because um a lot of the book is about perception how we perceive things in lots of different ways not necessarily about our senses but in other ways what's going on behind the scenes but um i wanted to get a title that reflected that so i'm trying to get titles that will play with the idea of sight through <laughs> i'm not doing very well but i might have to pick your brains jackie but the sight unseen uh, sort of implies that you are seeing things but you're maybe not necessarily seeing the things that you need to see Mm, mm. <laughs> yeah yeah it it does and and, and it you know and it takes me back to to the reading that you did where johnny's seeing something yeah but what is it that he's seeing or or in the sense that you know in our communities you know whether it's our family you know immediate community or our village town communities you know what do we see and how do we perceive it? How do we read situations or how do we understand people? And do we yeah. need, you know, greater understanding? Do we need to delve further yeah. so that, you know. Sometimes we, we don't see what's under our noses. There's a there's a, a character in this book who is a cleaner. Uh, there's a lot going on with that character, but nobody sees her because she's mm -hmm. a cleaner. And how often have we been talking about mm -hmm. this during this pandemic that we do not notice people mm -hmm. and that that's mm -hmm. that's bad mm, isn't it isn't it and and that idea that or that in, in the other as well in the pandemic that finally we've come to realize who the important people are yeah. in our society whereas you say previously you know we we, we would have just gone by them we wouldn't have seen yeah. them acknowledged them recognized yeah. what it is that they do that holds it all together. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love, because again, I, I've, I've read where you've said that idea of, um, um, it's my attempt, my humble attempt to give a face to the faceless and a voice to those who need to be heard. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I, I, you know, you were just mentioning that, and, and I, for me, it's a really important part of, you know, of, of being able to convey ideas if you have a gift as you well and truly do have a gift you know and and then to be able to bring things out that maybe we don't see we don't hear we're not willing to acknowledge so mm. I, I just want to say thank you for what you do oh, with your you. work <laughs> no yeah. there's things that i i feel i want to think about and write about and 
so yeah it is a humble attempt because i'm not like sarah sutherland i'm not a historian or anybody that does have a voice in that sense so this is my way of of doing that yeah 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 so now um what i wanted to ask was if if you and this is not an elevator pitch so don't you know don't get because the books, I'm the books rubbish at those. yeah the book sold it's out there oh well it will be yeah I, yeah we can yeah um if you had to sum up what you wanted a reader and i know you would never pressurize anybody into reading any way but if there was one thing that you hoped they took away from this book what would it be warmth i think warmth and caring and i think that's really timely but the warmth of family uh, the bonds that unite us and it doesn't have to be your family uh, you know we're all connected and i think I, I think the book shows that we are all connected and we need to open our eyes and wake up and uh, honor the people that we're connected with Mm, mm. <laughs> oh, oh gorgeous yeah honoring those that we're connected with and and I, and I do like what you say that that isn't necessarily biological family because they're all different kinds of families Absolutely. yeah that that we belong to but uh, and and I think and and I think it, you know and and through the pages of the novel that is demonstrated as well you know you know whether that be immediate family or or, or small town configurations or even across the divide of time yes you know that people can yeah. be connected even without knowing yeah you know that th th they're connected yeah. um so so i wonder if i might and and i know this is going to be really cheeky of me to ask but you said earlier on that of course sight unseen for you it, it has been you know it it's been delivered and it's ready to be brought forth. So you now are working on something else. Yeah. I'm working and it, on two things. Are you? Oh, 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 please, please, <laughs> please, please, please. You know, because it's it's always good to get insight. Um, and and you know, because because we'll all be getting sight and seen, and then we'll need to know what comes next. And um, there, there was a, a beautiful quote from the Dundee Courier, which I thought was brilliant. And I and I just was like, yes, in, in from for sight and seen, it says. This gripping tale has left me longing for a sequel. Oh well, there you go. They're yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, and that's two, that's two of us. Well, I know that, that that's more of us, um, and I know that's coming. But you say you're working on two things. So what well, are those two things? Um, the second book, Sarah Sutherland's sec second book, is finished. So that's just waiting to be edited. Um, so that takes place partially in India, um, oh. when Sarah has to. Uh, reconnect with her daughter let's put it like that <laughs> oh. uh, and the other book that i'm working on is um a rather random gothic i, I don't know if anybody will want this book but i've really enjoyed writing it oh. i'm living <laughs> a random gothic come on <laughs> it's a random gothic a locked house mystery it's a bit mm -hmm. agatha christie and mm -hmm. i don't know where it fits within my <laughs> oh but 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 brilliant i mean what 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 strikes me from what you're saying is you know because i asked you where do you think you are you know in your trajectory as an author and what it's sounding for me is you, you've got freedom here you've got freedom to develop yeah. i just i just had this idea and it was sitting there and i had to write it i think when you've got to write something you've just got to write it so i've nearly mm. finished that and then I'll be looking at um, book three of the Sarah Sutherland series, which I have a really interesting idea, which may or may not be related um, to the pandemic, because I think that's mm -hmm. in our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, Still. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, before we close, I, I, I'm going to bring you back to the Gothic again. Yeah, because you, you obviously that there's a very strong link between you and the gothic and i want to know where it all began when when did you when did you get hooked on the gothic i don't know i read a book years and years ago um it's called the book of human skin by michelle lovrick a really really interesting book set in venice and well 
you know, it does what it says on the tin, you can imagine with that title. And it wasn't the sort of book that I would read. I think at that time I was reading sort of, I don't know, romances or something. And Oh, where's Sandra gone? I think we've lost her. I hope she comes back. Um, well, in case we don't get Sandra back with us, um, I hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed um, our conversation. Uh, oh, it has been wonderful to be. Hello, Sandra, are you back with us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought. I, I thought. I just kept talking. <laughs> I thought the Gothic was ever going to remain a mystery, and we. <laughs> I'm not sh quite sure what you heard, but I was just saying that th this book, the Book of Human Skin, the uh, author managed to turn the, the lens on the reader. And how do you feel when you're reading this book? And I thought that was really clever. And I think that's what the Gothic does. It tells us something about ourselves, which we may not know. Mm, mm, it, oh, yeah. And... Even with our book under discussion today, Sight Unseen, I, I think you just you do that with that book and you turn it back on us and you make us consider how we relate and react uh, to people. And um, would you do us the honours of holding that beauty up one yeah. last time? Yeah. Exciting. We should have oh, a no. of something busy. <laughs> we should. Yeah. yeah. Look at that absolutely delicious what is behind that door yeah, yeah. and it's even got the lights on <laughs> mm. and dare you dare you enter dare you enter yeah sandra from all of us at honey and stag we wish you all the very best with this publication thank yeah it's been we a also thank you I, seriously just thank you for, for for being here with us and we hope that we get the pleasure of of doing this with you in real life as well uh, when it's safe for us all all to be together um i just want to close by thanking all of us that have taken part joanne emma kelly behind the scenes who who holds this together so beautifully um sandra yourself and people out there watching just to let you know that if you're watching now and you have questions for Sandra if you put them in the comments um then she will be more than happy to answer them she'll be back on the chat with those okay so thank you so much uh, it just remains for me to say goodbye for now happy reading everybody and don't forget get that copy of sight and scene by Sandra Island. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>